All right. What's up, y'all? Dr. T. Hassan Johnson here. Welcome back to the Onyx Report. Hope all is well. Uh, y'all have to know it's been crazy. But anyway, before I get going, welcome back to the Onyx Report, uh, where we uplift black men and boys using critical analysis. Today is a, a special day. And uh, as, as as in terms of what generally happens on a special day, all hell breaks loose, technologically speaking. So I had to reboot my whole system 60 seconds before the show is supposed to go on the air. So y'all know how it is. But 73 people uh, already in the building. Please like, share, and subscribe on YouTube. We're broadcasting today across uh, platforms yet again. So we are on um, innerlightradio.com. We're on YouTube, on the Onyx Report uh, channel, uh, Dr. T. Hassan Johnson channel. We are also uh, broadcasting live from Facebook and um, going from there as well. And we are also on Twitch. So you can look up Dr. T. Hassan Johnson on all of those. Um, so we got a lot to cover today. Huge day, but I want to give people time to come in. Uh, so bear with me. Muada, what's going on? I see a number of my members in here, uh, which is good. Um, let's see. I hope everybody's well. Christopher, Joe, what's going on? Of course, uh, BGS in the building. Glad to have you. We'll be having you up in a minute. You already know. Um, MLR, appreciate that support, man. Um, really, very much appreciated. Thank you. Um, Hi, Scholar, what's going on? Um, let's see, Craig, we got a few people in here. Michael, what's the word? Uh, as you guys know, we're going to have an after show for members um, um, right after. Jung, thank you very much for the support. Uh, McConan, if I mispronounced that, I apologize. Taylor, what's going on? It looks like we got a full house. Um, and uh, I can't be any more grateful. That is, of course, right when <laughs> friends that I haven't seen in, in years are texting me out the blue and Facebook messages popping up like this is crazy uh my mixer completely disappeared uh so i'm hoping i sound okay uh joe appreciate that support um but like i said we got a real special day so we got some guests coming in it's gonna be a big day what's up gg gg in the house uh isa what's going on adam what's happening gavin uh yeah we got a whole roll call coming in all right all right so let me get in let's get it started Y'all already know, as I share my little screen here. Yeah, 100 people. Looks like we, we, we're we doing pretty well. Thank you, Tozen. Uh, glad the audio is clean. Um, good to know. I wasn't sure. Um, Dennis, what's up? Just hooked up a new preamp, so I definitely wanted to make sure we were good. Um, but uh, just to get it going, in case you didn't know uh across platforms whether you're on youtube or you're interested in patreon you can support the show by becoming a member um right so you can become a member here there's there's different levels of membership that come with various perks you have the gold level membership diamond level and onyx level those are all on youtube and if you're interested in any of those click the join button right there on the youtube video right next to the subscribe button obviously if you haven't subscribed please go ahead and do that as well but you can click the join button and look at the various perks offered. And then there's also a Meteor and Black Opal level um, where you can even help to determine subjects to go on the air. So you can look those up and uh, on YouTube, see if you wanna do that. On Patreon, we have our film review series. So I've twice a month, I review films, but it's really designed for parents of uh, Black Sons to, and, and using film to facilitate dialogue. So I just give you some tips. I give you some things you can focus on and how to navigate those discussions. Uh, and that's the film review series. So you can support that through Patreon um, membership through there, right? So either one is 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 great. And I hope you'll take a, take a chance to consider that. We obviously have a, a, a whole new venture opening up today uh, that quite a few people are here for, I imagine. And we'll be getting into that shortly. Um, but, you know, I wanna get into a few other things and give people time to kind of file in a little bit um so let's jump right in we're going to dive into our sacred black masculine series uh feel free to use it on twitter and send me examples isa appreciate that for becoming a member congratulations welcome um but yeah use uh use it on twitter you can also send it to me through facebook messenger but examples 
of uh, black males, you know, of course, uh, doing something that uh, is worthy of acknowledgement. We like to do that over here. We celebrate black males uh, over this way. So um, hopefully you all will help me in that endeavor because there's a lot to celebrate despite what others may say, right? Um, let's see. Let's start out here with this young man, student who took 21 AP courses, becomes the first black male valedictorian at, Victorian at his high school. Uh, Rollin Lee Tate Jr., 18 year old teen from Georgia, made history as the first black male valedictorian in high school. Um, more than that, he has secured 1.3 million in college scholarships. In a now viral tweet, uh, Tate shared his list of academic accomplishments, which included having a 4.7 GPA, uh, being the top of his class for seven years and being uh, a Georgia scholar. He also took 21 AP courses, never got any grade lower than a 98. Tate has been accepted to 14 colleges such as Ohio State, Florida A&M, Georgia Tech, Howard, uh, Rose Holman, Hampton, University of Georgia, North Carolina A&T, Tuskegee, and more. Out of those schools, Tate decided to go um, uh, to North Carolina A&T, where he'll pursue a degree in mechanical engineering and a full on a full academic scholarship. Um, aside from that, a, he also excels in extracurricular activities and clubs, played two varsity sports, became inducted into the seven um, national honor societies. He's part of the school band, taught himself how to play the piano and is a rapper. So shout out to this young man, uh, Rollin Lee Tate Jr., right? Um, that's what's up. You know what I mean? And these kind of, we got black kids that do this and, and they're not really celebrated. They're not publicly acknowledged. So we need to make sure we do that around here, right? Um, next up a bit, uh, actually the next two are a little sad, but we still hold um, some honor uh, in regard to that. So this, this particular story has to do with a Tuskegee Airman from Philadelphia who was lynched by Nazis, right? The morning of April 3rd, 1945, Second Lieutenant Walter P. Manning of West Philadelphia sat in a jail cell at a Nazi Air Force base in Austria. There was a mob at the door, ropes at the ready. The doomed fighter pilot, uh, battered and beaten, wore his wings on his collar. He was a proud Tuskegee Airman, member of the country's first black combat aviation unit. Back in Philly, Manning um, had gained attention for his de dedication to his dream of becoming uh, a flyer. He failed his physical exam because of a hammer toe and could have avoided the war altogether. Instead, he used his defense plant salary to pay for surgery so he could fly. Um, so he'd escaped uh, death several times, um, uh, one by bailing out of his plane after a dogfight where he'd taken out a German fighter. Then when a local policeman pulled him from a mob that greeted his parachute near Linz. He'd flown more than 50 missions and six times was awarded the Air Medal for Heroism. He had a fiance whose picture he kept close. He was not yet 25. Outside his cell, the mob was waiting, primed to do just what Nazi propaganda instructed, uh, which ironically enough, wasn't a whole lot different than what many of us experienced here in the US. Nevertheless, wanted to shout out this brother, Second Lieutenant Walter P. Manning, West Philadelphia, uh, Tuskegee Airmen. Shout out to you, sir, right? Um, we need to acknowledge it. You know, acknowledged brothers have done uh, incredible things. And there, like I said, there are quite a few. Uh, this and, and I treat the Sacred Black Masculine series randomly. It's a matter of how it comes to me, uh, especially if it's a new article or something of that nature. Uh, but any chance we get to celebrate black men, black boys, we do so. Uh, even if it's a, a sad occasion on one level or another, we still honor the brother's life. Now that also goes, unfortunately, to this young man here. Master Chef Junior star Ben Watkins dies at age 14. Right? Uh, fan favorite favorite from Master Chef Junior died on Monday after an 18 month battle with cancer. 14 years old. Uh, ben Watkins was diagnosed with angiomatoid fibrous histiocytoma, an extremely rare form of cancer. I don't know if I mispronounced that. Um, the soft tissue tumor most commonly occurs in children and young adults. His family, family previously uh, shared he was one of six people in the world to receive such a diagnosis. Damn. After losing both of his parents in September 2017, um, he ha we have marveled at Ben's strength, courage, and love for life, the family shared in a statement after his passing. 
Watkins lost both of his parents to domestic violence. He never ever complained. Ben was and will always be the strongest person we know. When Ben's rare illness was shared with the world, he was so heartened by the outpouring of love he received from every corner of the globe, especially here in his hometown of Gary, Indiana. So this this young man apparently uh, had been on the show. Master Chef Junior was uh, you know acknowledged by Gordon Ramsay. They said he was a, you know was an excellent chef, but uh, endured something that you just can't imagine a child having to endure. So shout out to this young man, um, and uh, we hope his spirit is at rest. Right. And on a slightly uh, up bent note. Right, local man moved out of his gang life into becoming Missouri's Teacher of the Year. Uh, this is in Crestwood. Teachers are responsible for much more than just the academic success of their kids. A local teacher's incredible stories inspired him to change generations and lead to an incredible recognition. Um, uh, Darian Cockrell, or DC, uh, says, I'm getting paid to have fun with kids. This is the best job in the world. He's a PE teacher at Crestwood Elementary. Uh, he's been teaching for the last six years and his students love him. Um, he talks about starting from the bottom in six deuce, eight, seven kitchen crip gangster. Um, and now he's a 2021 teacher of the year uh, in, in Missouri, right? From a neighborhood in North St. Louis city to Missouri's uh, 2021 teacher of the year award. He grew up believing uh, that he only existed to fail, right? He says, I was born uh, to an addicted, a drug addicted mother who had two of her six kids by the age of 16. My father was murdered when uh, I was four and began my journey in and out of the foster care system um, not long after my sixth birthday. Um, he says in middle school, uh, he leaned on his teachers, confided in a school counselor and was adopted by his football coach. The adoption altered the way he viewed the world and his place in it. When I changed the way I looked at things, uh, the things around me started to change. I had a lot of struggles and a lot of hurdles. And if not for those educators, I would not be here today. Now, I can't say anything about, you know, the people he associated with. I don't know much about who adopted him, but I do want to say that there are a lot of men. I talked about this a couple months ago. We talked about different types of activism that uh, groups get involved with. And black men are sometimes criticized uh, for not engaging in street activism enough, even though we know black men do. Uh, I also want to shout out the fact that many black men engage in a lot of different types of activism. And I would argue that coaching and supporting kids is a form of activism, right? So, um, you know, uh, even if even if the coach that adopted him wasn't a black male, um, I would still say there are plenty of brothers that are doing that very thing. So shout out not only to DC here and uh, applaud to him. I applaud him on his accomplishment of becoming a Missouri's teacher of the year. But also shout out to the scores of black men who support kids, teens, young men, and other grown men in a variety of ways that are often unsung, right? Shout out to y'all. Because I know nobody's calling you out, but if you can hear the sound of my voice, I hope you, you take that um, with my compliments. Because at the end of the day, uh, we know that this is happening, even though nobody often says anything about it. Uh, what's up, Crimson Cure? I see Kalila in the building. How you doing, Kalila? Right. Um, all right. So we got a few people in here. So we're going. Y'all make sure you support the show. We got 193 in. And we're gonna move on ahead till we get to uh, the meat of some things. Now, y'all know I like to jump into current events, and uh, there are some very interesting things that are going on that uh, I think we should keep up with. This was uh, a coloring book sent to me, um, apparently uh, made by various members of um, um, BLM. So it is a, a gender affirming uh, and LGBT affirming coloring book, right? And you can see some of the various pages here. And the reason I point this out is as we would expect and as has been part of the debate going on for quite a while we can definitely see an absence of black men uh rasheed barnes thank you very much for that support right and that absence of black men you see it on one page there are a couple of brothers in here um but as far as you know heterosexual brothers fathers in particular you'll find that in much of the literature and until recently on the website 
there was a dearth of such black men. And so it's just to highlight that these things are still happening. And there's an ongoing um, misandry, anti-black misandry that is very much targeted um, at black men from even within the community. And unfortunately, even media such as this continues to affirm that absence uh, very purposefully. So I just wanted to take a moment to kind of show how this actually continues to play out and affect black men, even in absence. And if you're talking about media like this, which, you know, usually coloring books are targeted toward children, you can see the lasting effect it has to make black men virtually absent, um, unless they are LGBT, um, and what impact that might have on a whole future generation of children who are growing up being socialized with the idea that black men are not essential to families. So just to kind of put that out there, it is uh, still happening. Yeah, yeah, Mike, it is a BLM coloring book, right? All right, moving on, All right? We've got teaching assistant, 32, is jailed for two years after having sexual relationship with pupil, 15. That made him consider mutilating his own genitals uh, in desperate bid to end the abuse. Interesting. All right, her name is Faye McCrawby, was 25 when she was groomed, when she groomed the pupil, excuse me, inviting him to martial arts classes. Court heard she uh, she believed relationship was real and saw victim as her boyfriend. When the teen ended it, she told the victim she was going to kill herself, court heard. Judge branded behavior as coercive and controlling as well as a breach of trust. McCrawby, now 32, was jailed for two years, four months after admitting three counts of causing a child to engage in sexual activity at Reading Crown Court. Right. Now, now these are, you know, I, I said this before, a lot of these cases are happening more frequently, either that or they're being reported on far more than they have been in the past. And yet they still don't seem to make the uh, national scene as far as it being considered an ongoing issue. For some reason it still kind of falls under and you can tell that the tone is very different because the titles for the most part part always kind of have this these terms like these sexual relationship right but if you have a 25 year old male teacher and a 15 year old girl trust me when i tell you sexual relationship is not the term that they will be using in the title so again we got to keep our eye on how uh, these kind of dynamics are presented or represented in media and how it shapes our public perception right if, if the language like this kind of soft serves these stories to people, and yet when the genders are reversed, gives us a very negative and punitive kind of narrative, it lets us know that the, uh, the affirmation of allowing women, you know, to go unrestricted and, and hyper punishing men um, will produce some very offset conclusions, particularly as it relates to the next generation. But it's not just her. There's another, right? Married teacher sexually assaulted by boy or sexually, excuse me, see, here, married teacher sexually assaulted boy, 13, uh, then threatened to harm herself and him if he told, right? So the threat to harm oneself is definitely a controlling gesture in a relationship, but it's a different thing if you've had um, some years to mature and manage uh, these kind of incidents. But if you're 13 years old and you're dealing with a grown woman who's married, who's threatening to hurt herself, the age of 33, uh, that can be difficult to deal with, especially, you know, for a 13 year old boy. So cybersecurity chief fired openly debunked. Uh, oh, wait, I'm sorry. That's the wrong part. But uh, married teacher assaulted boy, uh, former Pennsylvania middle school gym teacher pleaded guilty Tuesday to three counts of statutory sexual assault after abusing her 13 year old male student. Uh, her lawyer lawyer confirms to people. Rochelle Cressman, 33, was charged in 2019 with more than 60 counts, including 10 counts of statutory sexual assault, 10 counts of involuntary deviant sexual intercourse, and 42 counts of indecent assault of a person. Uh, the Titusville Area School District teacher was accused of having sexual contact with the student at least 10 times beginning in September 2018 and ending in April 2019. So you can check that out on newsbreakapp.com because these are coming out every week. I keep telling people these stories are far more common than people want to give credit for. All right. Moving on. 
Terrible data on black boys in California shows the need to break down state test scores by gender. So part of the problem we have with a lot of the data that we get um, in various fields, right, is that for the most part, a lot of the data on black children in particular uh, is not disaggregated by gender, right? It's often kind of left as a, as a, you know, and hold on. Hold on, let me tell this brother, I'm on the air. <laughs> let me get back to you. He done blown me up like 30 times since I've been on the air. Um, all right. <laughs> oh, legends never die. Appreciate that support. <laughs> I keep the phone near me. CR Frank, appreciate the support. I keep the phone near me just in case my son needs to tell me something. But uh, unfortunately, that can go the other way when people want to hit you. But anyway, um, so yeah, we don't always break down the data. We don't disaggregate by gender. So problems continue to be articulated as black problems. And we don't often know whether or not, and when I say black problems, black problems would be problems that say in the context of education for the youth, a black problem would be something that both males and females are experiencing at roughly the same degree. But if it's a 90-10 split, that's not necessarily a black problem. That's a more specific issue, right? And so we need to start disaggregating data by both race and gender to get a sense of what problems are really, uh, you know, impacting uh, which group. Right. So in terms of this article, this is on LASchoolReport.com. A new data analysis of California test scores has revealed that three out of four black boys don't meet state reading requirements or standards. Excuse me. The data analyst and article, the data analysis and article published Wednesday by the nonprofit news organization Cal Matters provides a deep dive look at how gender interacts with race on state tests. It found that. Uh, one, girls have a sizable lead over boys in the language arts, regardless of race or economic status. Black boys struggle with test scores at an earlier age. Of all ethnic groups for which the state collects data, black boys trail black girls by the widest margin. Right? Origins of man. Appreciate that generous support. Thank you, sir. Um, so what we're finding, again, is this is data affirming uh, what we've kind of found out in other circles, because we know 75% of boys in California, in the K through 12 system uh, are functionally illiter uh, illiterate. We do know that um, the teachers are over 90% uh, in certain contexts female, and that re there is data to suggest that that has an impact on the students themselves, right? So it, it, it's not surprising when we factor in race where the majority of those teachers are white, that black boys will find themselves on the furthest end of being able to advance but it's not li just limited to k through 12 right uh here aamc.org reports that um show a decline in black males entering medicine now this is kind of inevitable when you talk about um you know low reading performance right how are you going to engage in stem if the reading comprehension level is a problem right um so here this article says Despite efforts by medical schools to increase diversity among applicants, the number, the numbers for one demographic, black men, uh, have remained stagnant for nearly 40 years. In 1978, 1,410 black men applied to U.S. medical schools. In 2014, the number was 1,337, according to the new AAMC report, altering the course black males in medicine. Along with the applicants, findings also show that black male matriculants have made little headway in the past four decades. In 1978, there were 542 black male matriculants to MD granting institutions. In 2014, that number was 515. In addition, despite an overall increase in the number of black male college graduates, the proportion of male to female medical school applicants is lower for African Americans. Right? Kids of color are more likely to be low performing school, uh, be at in low performing schools than are um, that are under sourced, right? Uh, you have issues of physical infrastructure crumbling, outdated textbooks, and teachers not credentialed to teach in the subjects they're teaching. All of these problems compound, and and I suspect that they have a disproportionate impact on males of color. But again, this is a statement by uh, one Smedley, as they name the as they're named in the AAMC report but again if we don't disaggregate the data to any great degree we're left to speculate on the issues now, i do know some of my subscribers are in the medical field and in the sciences so feel free feel free 
to um, give any more additional data in the comments uh, about what it is that black males experience in medicine or in STEM in general. But uh, we can see that these kind of uh, ongoing structural issues have an impact on which young men even finish high school, let alone are able to go to college uh, and again, let alone uh, enter med school, right? These are the kind of issues we grapple with. Okay, Tennessee State Meharry Medical College announced accelerated program designed to produce more black doctors and dentists. Two historical black institutions in Tennessee have joined forces to create an initiative dedicated to creating more black dentists and physicians. Black students make up 7.7% of medical students in, two, in, in oh, I think it's supposed to be 2016, up from 5.6% in 1980. Data from the Association of American Medical Colleges shows Meharry was about eight has about 800 students enrolled. African-Americans continue to be underrepresented in medical schools, says Dr. Glenda Glover, president of TSU. This partnership will help level the playing field and give them better opportunities that they so deserve. We look forward to working with Meharry Medical College to produce African-American physicians and dentists who will serve the communities that need them most. Even more, we're proud to have the initiative named after the esteemed Dr. Levy Watkins Jr., one of our, one of our own, who was a game changer. Right. I bring these up because even looking at the picture, and I hope people can take advantage of this opportunity. I'm, one of the reasons I'm reporting on it is just so if you're in a position where this is advantageous for you, I hope you can take advantage of it. But I also put it up because even in terms of the image that we can see, the lasting impact of questionable K-12 through support, you can see how it uh, further impacts black males. Right. And the question from the last report raised here is how many black males would likely be able to benefit from even programs like this. I reported a couple months ago that even at HBCUs, black males find themselves in the lowest numbers. So the question yet again becomes, are we seeing structural uh, processes put forth to directly target black males? So it's not enough that it be targeted at black people in general. Right. If the problems are specific enough where black males are suffering to a greater degree and yet we're not seeing those programs how do i know when i ask people you know i got about sixteen thousand between the eleven thousand on youtube the five thousand on facebook when i ask people to extend information about black male specific support programs small business support program particularly since covid things of that nature anything targeted at helping black males when i ask people to send me that information we get crickets Let's see, uh, Mr. Heat, thanks for becoming a new member. Darius, appreciate that support, right? We'll look at an article like this. Found this a few days ago, right? Spotify cultivates female podcasters of color with SoundUp's return, right? Now, these are the kind of things I'm talking about, right? I'm, it, it, they're directed and targeted. You see, it's based off of, of, off of a philosophy that really comes back to patriarchy theory, right? The philosophy is essentially that you know all men are patriarchs and therefore hold this advantage over all women and therefore we need to have programs designed to help women in general across race and class because all women are oppressed by all men and that lacks specificity because all men don't experience the same dynamics right so with that in mind um these kinds of programs with spotify and other corporate uh, kind of structures who are looking to change their image, maybe even have some sincere desire on one level or another, uh, you know, to, to help, seldom target black males as a demographic. And I think the result of that is many black men have felt left for generations to their own devices. They don't expect help, they rarely get it. And even, and even having conversations about what black men want collectively, is difficult to have sometimes because I think most black men are not accustomed to being singled out. If you look at the discussions from the last couple of months about what black men want, and you, and you look at the Democrat and Republican parties trying to court black men, you could tell how much they don't understand. They, they've done everything from having strippers on poles to, you know, trying to sit in barbershops to have discussions with black men about what we want, failing to actually get to any policy issues, right? And we're going to see a little bit later just how off key many of these public these politicians are, but it's not just limited to politicians, right? It's limited to it's also a, associating with 
these, these kind of corporate entities, government entities that are involved in gentrifying the community, right? Providing very specific advantages to very targeted demographics. This produces over time a buffer class, a buffer class that has access to something that others in their own racial group don't have. Right? We've already been experiencing this, and yet it keeps happening. So um, look out for these kind of opportunities. And if you see them, uh, whether it targets men, black men or black women, send them to me. Because I've been making this argument for months now that black men have been severely overlooked. Except when it comes to being critical. Right? Um, let me see. I think on inner light, we might need to mic. We need, might need to mute a mic. Um I'm hearing some noise coming from over there. Um, anyway, so we have uh, this piece here. This is a tweet put forth by Terry McMillan that uh, Waiting to Hex Exhale is going to be a TV series, right? Produced by Lee Daniels. Oh, I'm sorry. Hold on one second. My engineer, can we, uh, I think we might need to mute the mic on inner light on the, uh, on Skype, anyway. Um, yeah, I don't know where I'm hearing that from. Okay. Uh, all right, so anyway, so as we can see, uh, Terry is about to embark on a new dimension of waiting to exhale. Um, Brother Neil, uh, mute your mic for me on both systems. Uh, let me see, okay. So, you know, she's about to put forth uh, this uh, Waiting to Exhale um, series, and we can, I mean, you can imagine what it's going to do if you remember the original book and the original film. Um, it is more and more of this. This is the kind of anti-black misandry that black men have been talking about now for a couple of years. Um, and it's films like these, it's series like these, it's books like these that have taught new generations how to hate black men in wholly new ways. So to see the regeneration of projects like this is sad in one vein and frustrating in another, right? Because so much of this is rehearsed and taught through media that it becomes more and more difficult to make the case for black men using data and accurate information because people it will tend to lend themselves, lend their, their interpretation to media you know, to colloquial understandings rather than what the data actually says is going on. And so film series like these, television series like these continue to uh, debilitate the image of black men in the name of um, supposedly uplifting black women. Now the two don't have to be connected in such a way, but it seems like it's always presented that way, right? In order to uplift black women, you have to denigrate black men. You don't need to. And yet, these kinds of series relish in doing that. So we've had a couple of generations now of men and women who have been socialized into this belief that black men are lesser beings. And it's stories like this that affirm that narrative. Rather than critically analyzing what the issues are in the black community, it's primarily taken from one vantage point and with this higher platform extended by, you know, um, you know, television platforms, media companies presents black males to be the sole problem in the community. Uh, Kaluminati, appreciate the support. All right. 279 in the building. Again, like, share, subscribe, support the show. Um, I am putting in the comment section uh, how to do so. You can do so on Cash App, PayPal, Patreon, Venmo. Or you can become a member of the show on YouTube. Click the join button right next to the subscribe button. If you haven't already, All right? Okay, so moving forward. This little piece I found interesting, right? Barack Obama admits to leaving wife Michelle feeling tense, lonely, and isolated as he worked into the night while economic and foreign policy crises piled up for his administration. He admitted to leaving her um, feeling these ways as he worked into the night uh, when crises piled up for his administration. The former president has revealed how tender moments faded with the first lady as the political, politically poisonous cocktail of war and financial turmoil gripped the White House. You know, 
it's interesting. I never see any other president go through this kind of mess, right? Where they have to be presented as wayward and unsupportive husbands uh, behind leading the damn country. But nonetheless, these are the kinds of images that people seem to want to see, and Barack seems to be more than happy to provide them. But the question of actually being in a position like this, right? Unprecedented for any black male that we've known um, to this degree and in this kind of position. And yet having to come out in this fashion and, and be framed as, um, you know, what is very consistent in terms of how black men and black, uh, you know, love interests, intimate partners and husbands are presented as wayward, unsupportive, um, disinterested, disconnected from not only their wives, but from family. These kinds of stereotypical gestures are highly problematic. And I, I really, um, really uh, disagree with, you know, this kind of portrayal of black men. And it doesn't seem that no matter what you're doing, that any of that can be taken into account as a viable reason to be as, bif as busy as one might be. Right? This is ridiculous, but we'll see more of this. Now, it kind of is connected to the next one. I was going to play this. This is a Dove. This is actually a Dove commercial. And uh, I'm going to play it uh, with fair use uh, being stated. Hopefully they won't ding me because YouTube has been extra interesting lately. But I'm not, I'm not going to play the whole thing. I'm only going to play it to a second. You can, you'll hear why in a moment. Okay, like I said, I'm only going to play a clip from it. And the reason I was only going to play a clip is because there are several of these I found. Several of these. You can you can search for them on YouTube. And not even limited to just Dove as a product. Oh, it said no sound? Damn it. <laughs> See, I don't know. what. I think once my mixer restarted, I'm not sure uh, how to get that sound back in. I do apologize. <laughs> damn it all right let me see um but what i'm saying though is that you know part of what we're dealing with at this point uh in commercials like these is kind of a low-key attack on black men in, a, in another way um okay here we go i think that setting should change it i'm gonna pull it up again and you guys let me know if you got any sound Share the audio. Where'd it go? Hmm. Okay, there it is. All right. Okay, so tell me if you guys can hear this. There's a lot of stereotypes around black men created by false media narratives. They're shown as thugs, gangsters. It's an unfair judgment. Black men care about black women. Black men care about their families. Black men care. Okay, could you guys hear that? All right. So what I was saying is that uh, part of the problem, with, and there are a lot of these kind of commercials I've run across. It's not just limited to Dove, uh, but even in, in, in terms of Dove, they had a few of them, right? And you'll notice they have a series for black women. I reported on it a couple weeks ago uh, with Dove and they have a series for black men. Um, the interesting part is the one for black men, you know, you have this, uh, this question of what black men care about, right? Where they're trying to basically explain that black men are human beings. They care about the world. They care about issues. They care about family. But I noticed it was a, a very particular moment where they had to so, show black men caring about black women. But if you watch any of the Dove commercials for black women, there's no such public affirmation, public acknowledgement of affection. None. At all. It's primarily a one-way street. Right? Where black men are um, shown, you know, 
kind of put in this position where they have to prove publicly that they have love for black women, but there's no such requirement in any other context. And it becomes a question when you watch all of the Dove commercials, right? Where you have these black men, you know, espousing their concerns, their issues, and each one of them seems to have this required statement about their love for black women when there is no such requirement extended in any other context, especially in involving the women. They don't have to articulate any kind of concern, right? And so again, it kind of contributes to the narrative that one, black men are wayward. You know, black women are, are uh, black men are difficult to understand. They need to be explained. They're inhuman, essentially speaking, but they have to affirm their affections toward black women. There's a lot of to me. And it goes along with things like this. Anybody heard of this? It's called Blood on Her Badge. All right. This is actually, uh, you can find the trailer for this on YouTube. Just type in Blood on Her Badge. It's TV One show where they actually talk about, uh, in this instance, um, well, here, I'll just show you. There have been reports that you've been driving around with a young man. I'm talking about robbing people who deserve to get jacked. Step out of the car now. Why don't you keep that cash, officer? We're rolling now. This is a love story. I would have done anything to keep him. I'll make sure everything turns out right. Yeah. I mean, they have a series of shows like this, especially on channels like TV One and BET, you know, uh, where basically you have this innocent woman and she's being accosted, controlled, beaten uh, by black men. And it's such a repetitive story. It's at the point where you can literally watch the trailer and it really doesn't vary much from the entire damn movie. But yet again, another series, another show, another film about how black women are suffering um, by black men. How many black men in just the trailer you saw tried to, you know, tried to control her, tried to manipulate her, tried to get her to do something evil. And again, in these kind of series, she has no agency, right? She's just, she just follows whomever. And when things go wrong, it's because of some oppressive guy. What I'm talking about with these multiple examples right, is the simultaneous downplaying and underdeveloping of the black male image, while at the same time presenting black women as being solely, uh, being, you know, having, lacking agency entirely, but also being nothing more than subject to black male uh, monstrosity, you know, monstrosities, these, these, these men who are out to, you know, destroy black women at every turn, right? Long-suffering matriarch, exactly, BGS. Same kind of dynamic. And we see it playing out over and over and over again. And it's repetitive and problematic. And yet, we keep seeing it. I just want to be, I want you to be aware. Uh, Mike says these networks are not owned by us. Absolutely, they're not. They're absolutely not. Yet they appear to be. And they use enough black faces to give the idea that they are. Uh, black faces, even in management, but or lower level management, really, um, but also in terms of the faces we see on the screen. And yet the images are so consistently anti-black male that we've grown accustomed to it. Right? We don't even think about it. But I'm saying this has a lasting effect on a multi-generational level. It tells black families that they cannot trust in black men, expect much from black men. But more importantly, it tells black boys and men that they aren't worth anything. And that this is all they can be. And it affirms these messages over and over again, very repetitively, right? Because if you see this, especially as a kid, from different sources over and over, and it's the same underlying messages that black men are not human, black men lack compassion, intelligence, creativity, and yet all they seek to do is oppress, rape, steal, beat, and control. If you don't have anyone directly to contradict those narratives, how much do you even expect from yourself as a young boy, right? So we have to challenge these kind of notions. Um, two pieces here, one on USA Today and one on Newsweek.com. 
dealing with the question of reparations uh, for Biden uh, and whether or not he'll address that. And both of these, you know, you can go check this out. This is one, this one, like I said, is on USA Today. After Biden win, uh, black activists demand reparations for slavery. And the second piece is on Newsweek.com. Biden leaves uh, reparations out of racial equity plan despite left's call for reform. So I find this interesting, right? Because th I reported last week that uh, one of the founding members of BLM, I think it was Patrice Cullors, sent a letter to the Biden-Harris, uh, you know, office and suggested that there needs to be a sit down about black issues. Nobody said anything. But when Ice Cube actually tried to put forth a plan prior to sitting down so that black America can at least have some kind of semblance of an agenda that any political party that wants our votes needs to be able to um, acclimate to, he was denounced, he was dismissed, and he was called everything from a patriarch to a misogynist because he didn't have a specific component of the plan targeted at women. And he didn't have one targeted at men for that matter. And there's plenty of reason that he could, but he targeted it to the black community and yet he was criticized. So now we're at a, we're at a place where black folk, male and female, right? Men and women uh, voted for Democrats as usual in the highest numbers. And despite narratives that black men don't care, we essentially put Biden into office and yet did not demand anything prior to doing so. And I have plenty of people in my Facebook stream that will, uh, or comment section that will argue that that is the way it should be. We should have no pushback. We should have no requests. We should just accept it and be happy because maybe some of the policies will trickle down and benefit uh, more of us. I think that day is played. I think it's a day and age for specifics. And I think black men, more than any other demographic, have every right to demand specifics. So if you're new to the Onyx Report, you know that we have an ongoing issue we deal with here. There are an ongoing collective issue. We, um, we frame it, it's called the Black Male Political Agenda, and it is actually made by the members of the Onyx Report, listeners, subscribers, who send in ideas. And you can find it on newblackmasculinities.wordpress.com, right? Where you actually get to see, you know, what uh, some of these ideas are. And there's a long list of issues that black males have put on the table that they would like to see improved directly in their interest before anyone gets their votes. Right. So those two articles, I think, are interesting if you get a chance to look at them, because now basically what you have happening is people wondering what need, what we need to do to get Biden's attention. How can we get him to, you know, uh, consider our interests and the primary interest, particularly reparations was put off the table by Biden. Right. Nobody said anything until afterwards, or at least a few did. So somehow we gotta play catch up and hope that uh, he'll listen. Interesting. So I just thought I'd put that out there. You know, now you're playing this game of catch up, even though you had people trying to make demands before the votes were cast. And I don't think they were supported anywhere near as much. Ice Cube for that matter. Uh, and again, this is not so much a suggestion that Ice Cube's plan was perfect, but at least he had one. And he was actually open to negotiating with it, you know, negotiating what it could look like, what needed to be on it. He was absolutely open to do so. And more people had critiques of the fact that he even had one and was willing to engage the Republicans than they were about what the plan actually was. So now we have a Democratic, you know, president coming in, president elect and no plan. And he's been talking about minority plans uh, for a while now. So again, we're back to the same old, you know, trickle down theory, except now instead of it being a Reagan articulated, you know, kind of dynamic, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a liberal Democrat kind of framework, right? Where, where maybe the policies will trickle down in the long run and benefit the people at the bottom. What did, what did Obama used to call it? A rising tide lifts all ships. Doesn't lift you that far if you're low enough. ABX, appreciate the support. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. All right. All right. So next up, 2019 was the deadliest year for hate crimes on record. New FBI data shows. Now, it's going to be interesting when 2020 comes out. 
you know, we don't have to see if it exceeds 2019 but yet here we go all right the overall number of hate crimes rose to a 10-year high even as fewer law enforcement agencies bothered to report their statistics hello more people were killed in hate crimes last year in america than in any year since 1992 when the fbi first started recording such killings new data shows 51 people lost their lives to hate crimes in 2019 according to annual statistics the fbi released on monday that's a 112 percent increase over the year before the bulk of last year's hate crime killings occurred on august 3rd 2019 when a gunman shot and killed 23 people inside a walmart in el paso texas in an attack apparently targeting latinos but 2019 would have been a record year for deadly hate crimes even without the massacre in el paso um, according to brian levin executive director of the center for the study of the hate and extremism at csu uh, there were 7314 total hate crimes last year according to the fbi's annual uniform crime report a 2.7 increase percent increase from the year before and the highest number of recorded hate crimes the fbi has, has ever engaged in a single year since 2008. Hate crimes, according to the FBI's definition, are crimes motivated by bias against a person based on their race, religion, or sexual orientation, among other factors. As in previous year, the majority of hate crime victims, about 58%, were targeted due to their race or ethnicity. Nearly half of those targeted for their race were black. All right. So I would bet money that 2020 exceeded 2019 but of course a lot of this depends on whether or not there's accurate reporting and we know that that's been a question mark for generations yet and still here we are right boston to pay 3.1 million to black man who served 38 years in prison for murder he did not commit right city of boston will pay that money um to a man who spent nearly four decades in prison for a crime prosecutors agree he didn't commit Frederick Clay, now 57, had just turned 16 years old when he was arrested and charged as an adult for murdering a cab driver in 1979. He was convicted in 1981 and sentenced to life in prison. Now, so far, in terms of the, uh, I think it was the Exoneration Project, black men have constituted over, definitely over half of those uh, being released and $3 million dollars for 38 years in prison is ridiculous yet this is where we are this is how black men are seen and treated and we know there are plenty others you know it's always it's, it's a question mark as to whether or not you can even find the evidence to exonerate yourself let alone work your way through the process of getting it uh, into court you know if you if anyone questions that uh, you could at the very least, there's plenty of other ways to do it, but at the very least, you can go watch the film, uh, Brian Banks, and look at how much he had to go through to try and exonerate himself. Nevertheless, uh, these are the kind of issues that black men find themselves facing. Hold on one second. <clears throat> All right. Okay. So two more left. We're almost done, people. Okay, here we go. Some of you saw this. I think about 12 people sent it to me, right? PhD student who works at Notre Dame accused of stalking and killing her ex-boyfriend, right? Najinsky Dix. Now, Najinsky Dix, 37 years old, was charged with second degree murder in the shooting death of her ex-boyfriend. A 37-year-old woman was arrested Saturday in connection with the shooting death uh, uh, in Washington, D.C. Police confirmed in a press release shortly before 5.30 p.m., law enforcement responded to a call, the sound of gunshots at an apartment complex in D.C. Upon arrival, members located an adult male inside an apartment suffering from gunshot wounds. The victim displayed no signs consistent with life. According to court records obtained by NBCS in Chicago, an individual allegedly told investigators that Dix had been in a three-month-long relationship with Hickman that ended in May. Police said that according to the individual, Dix was allegedly stalking Hickman. Court re records stated that Dix was at the apartment and allegedly was kneeling at Hickson's feet when detectives arrived to the scene. 
she apparently was on the phone with her mother and she had suggested that she was pushed and that somehow was the reason she shot him but she apparently stalked him from out of state showed up at his apartment complex and he died and was killed yeah so it's these kinds of cases that I definitely want brothers to be careful of um but you know sometimes it, the red flags we like to you know believe are there are not always as clear nevertheless this young man is is dead at the hands of a woman he dated for three months please be careful fellas last one up Barack Obama's comments about hip-hop and Trump's increased support uh, from black men stirs up debate on Twitter so many of you have seen this uh, basically you know he has an upcoming book you know and one of the things he says is that the vote for Trump is primarily motivated, as far as black men are concerned is primarily motivated by our addiction to bling right hip-hop you know this is kind of superficial reading and what was offensive about it is when, especially when you put it in alignment with uh, Obama's uh, kind of consistent statements toward black men it's been problematic on, on, a, on a consistent basis very condescending very dismissive very rarely has he engaged black males from a serious standpoint uh, and, and really even made the assumption that we might have interests political and otherwise rather than just chaotic behavior with no rationale to it so this statement you know and i've told you guys before I, i'm 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 neither right or left i'm an independent i generally vote green um at the end of the day i i, I don't have a whole lot of faith in either major party but at the end of the day too i will also say that regardless of who black men vote for i am about black male independence and I'm about supporting black men, regardless of what their final choice is and being independent enough to make it and assess their own interests. And I find it offensive that we would dismiss that in the name of suggesting that black men are no more motivated to, to, to acknowledge their own interests, you know, than to listen to a song about bling. I mean, that to me was so offensive and ridiculous it doesn't even allow black men the option to be independent thinkers. So with that in mind, one of the things I'd like to do is welcome a good brother of mine, you know, Dr. Ronald Neal, to help me kind of break down some of what we're seeing uh, on a couple of levels before we jump into our major issue, because I think this requires um, some depth. Now, Dr. Neal, is the developer of the concept of both BMI and BMA. First of all, how you doing, brother? I'm doing well, man. Good to, good to be here once again. All right, I see you pulled out of Skype. Um, I think, uh, we, I, I don't know if we, I'm gonna wait to see if, uh, if Jamal can hear us on both. Okay, you can hear him, good. All right, so tell us, for those who don't know, and I don't know what rock they may have been living under, what is BMI and BMA? Yeah. Yeah, BMI, Black Male Independence, you know, it is simply, you know, Black men asserting their self-interest uh, in the way that um, is not uh, contingent upon uh, the opinions, uh, the ideas, the perspectives, um, the, the dispositions of, of other people. That is, is that Black men are uh, functioning in this way in, in, the, in the highest capacity uh, in a society that is supposed to be free, uh, in a society that is supposed to be, uh, you know, built around democratic, you know, traditions uh, and the like, a liberal society. It's black men um, really uh, demonstrating their full sovereignty, their autonomy as human beings in America. And uh, the independence part is very, very important because we have a very long history. We have a very long history where black men have um, been positioned in a very servile fashion. I mean, we, you know, we came here, we were not came here, but we were, we were slaves, we were enslaved. And, um, and after slavery, you know, our position uh, remained that of, um, of servitude. 
And so that never left. It never left. I mean, we can just, I mean, you can look at, you can go from slavery up until the, the, the modern civil rights era. And you look at someone like Martin Luther King Jr., who represents kind of the quintessence of the sacrificial black man. And, mm -hmm. and we, we have been understood to, to sacrifice our lives for the service of others uh, with no expectation that we get anything in return, okay? Mm -hmm. And we have reached a point in history where that understanding is, in my estimation, is obsolete. It is obsolete. Uh, it is um, self-destructive. It is detrimental. Uh, two black men. We tell women all the time um, that they can they can be autonomous. We tell them all the time that they can pursue and they should pursue their self-interest. Uh, white Americans in this society uh, have no constraints uh, placed upon how they express their interest. Uh, they do what they want to do, uh, and I and I think that it is um, it is it is horrible. It is uh, an affront to our sovereignty to continue to play this game uh, where we deny ourselves. And so, um, you know, that's what it's all about. Within the context of the family, you know, it's, it's about black men um, really gaining independence from, you know, those closest to them, their mothers, uh, their sisters, their daughters, their wives, their aunts, their grandmothers. I go on, even you know, fathers, brothers, uncles, and the like, um, particularly you know those people within our family structures, um, who who are conditioned to see us as servants, who are conditioned to see us as as uh, as slaves, and, uh, and and it is imperative you know upon us to um, to let them know that we are no longer interested in that 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 sort of dynamic and that blackmail. Uh, interest, self-interest matter, and we will pursue that. So that's basically what, what BMI is all about. Well, I had an exchange recently that I wanted to share real quick. Um, I posted your video, uh, one of the, you've been on fire lately, brother. If you don't know, please support Dr. Ronald Neal's channel. He just uh, hit over a thousand subscribers. Uh, so we wanna make sure we boost that number even more. So go on to YouTube, look up Dr. Ronald Neal and go ahead and subscribe to his channel but he's been talking a lot about bmi bmas uh affirming the support for ice cube and a number of other things and one of the things that that it ended up happening when i posted your video mm -hmm. uh on facebook i got someone who wrote in and it was a black woman and she said that she was highly offended mm -hmm. uh because she said she never turned on black men and she and her friends in corporate america um uh were not like that and she found the video and your concept to be highly divisive. Hmm. Um, and she said, you're es in essence, you're betraying uh, your people by making these kinds of statements. Hmm. What do you say to people like this? So she got at a point where she was like, well, I'm gonna unfriend you. And I said, well, all right, I'll try not to lose a lot of sleep. But anyway, um, what, what do you say to people that, that make the argument that hmm. this is selfish, this is divisive, black men are trying to hurt the community with mm -hmm. BMI or BMA, what are your thoughts? Yeah, my my, you know, my response to that is that um, you know the the community uh, is already divided, and uh, black men had nothing to do with the division. You know, as I indicated in that video, um, social engineers, intruders, uh, white feminists, uh, liberals, leftists, uh, they intruded into our affairs. You know, uh, after after the 1960s, you know, after the death of Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and, you know, that that is when the notion, you know, gender ideas became prominent. And that was the moment when um, gender began to replace race as an organizing principle. And, and the reality is, is that, um, you know, large numbers of women, particularly in the professional class, um, they bought into those notions. They bought into those notions of independence. Uh, they bought into the idea of women raising children by themselves. Um, um, we, we've seen what the state has done uh, in terms of family courts, in terms of social welfare. Uh, we see what happens with you know corporate America in terms of um, you know hiring practices and the like. And you know the greatest beneficiaries of affirmative action are not men; they're women. You know, and um, and so, 
Uh, my response to that is that, you know, we have a long, we have a documented history uh, of misandry. Uh, you just outlined, you know, in your, you know, introduction, your first hour, you know, the ongoing history of division. You know, you cited the, the defamation part with Terry McMillan. Um, and, you know, we have, uh, you know, a, a culture which we did not create. All right. Which has divided us now. And here's the other thing, you know, uh, I mentioned in that video, you know, the phenomenon of black girl magic, you know, the, the girl power thing. And, you know, we're at a place right now where, you know, black women see themselves as their own unique uh, group, that they have their own identity. It's almost as though yeah. uh, black women represent a, a, a distinct race. OK. Um, and so and, and they revel in it. You know, and, uh, and and there are deep undertones of, of misandry and all of that. Uh, and with the election, um, you know, and what has been uh, articulated around, you know, black women's vote and and female identity and, you know, female symbolism with Kamala Harris and all of that, um, that says to us is that the divisions didn't begin with black men and that um, we have. Um, we have no part in that. You know, what we're doing is simply um, recognizing it and responding to it. And I think that people who respond that way, um, you know, really behave in a very, in a fashion that's, that, that denies reality. You know, it's kind of like uh, white Americans who, who will deny, who will go out of their way to deny the reality of racism. Okay. Right. Uh, we will have these blatant is instances where uh, black people are, um, you know, victims of, of racist, racist violence, or we have, you know, documented instances where black people have been taken advantage of by, by banks, by the real estate uh, sector, uh, where black people have been defrauded in so many ways. And you will still have a population of white Americans who will say, well, you, you, you know, that's, 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 you know, uh, minuscule or, They'll even go so far as to you know pretend as though, as though it does not exist, and so those responses are are no different from that. It's just it's just denial, denial, and and denial. Um, okay. and so it's it's unfortunate that we do have um, people amongst us who refuse to look critically at just how how um, different we are. Uh, that is the, that is black men and black women, as I indicated in that video are on two distinct paths. We are not walking in the same direction. Okay. Well, one of the other reasons I invited you um, up today is as the video title suggests, this is the launching, the official launching of the Institute for Black Male Support. And what I'd like to do is kind of take uh, people through the site a little bit and then discuss a little about um, you know, why such an institute is necessary. And I think some of that uh, you've kind of articulated a moment ago, but um, here we go. So uh, let's see, let me go ahead and share this real quick. So what I'm sharing with you guys now is the uh, Institute for Black Male uh, Studies, the primary web website, instituteforblackmalestudies.com. And you'll notice the first thing you see uh, when you come on in is uh, this join the Institute mailing list. So if you could, please go ahead and submit your name and email if you haven't already. Um, and then from there, there's a new short intro by myself. You can go on and check out. I'm not going to play it here, but it is nonetheless uh, a site where you can kind of sift through and see some of the, uh, the offerings, see some of the, the various kinds of uh, information pertaining to black males. All of this in an attempt to, you know, focus on black males. You know, as people uh, hopefully know, uh, listening to the Onyx Report, black male studies um, is a field that is, 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 you know, kind of found scattered throughout various universities, usually through one person teaching a black male studies course. But the only primary um, uh, department, as it were, is in Edinburgh. Right. And you got to go to Scotland uh, with Dr. Tommy Curry to actually be able to 
participate in any formal way as far as being in a university um with the field and so uh hold on i'm trying my system is kind of slowed down here i apologize i'm trying to uh send something and it's giving me a little resistance so bear with me um there we go all right so we can get that out the way all right so uh you can go through here you can click through the menu you can go to the store and what you'll see up there now is uh our first course an introduction to black male studies part one um and uh, you can look into that as well as an upcoming three-part webinar on misunderstanding black men, manhood, and misplaced social expectations. Uh, so that's available in the store. And as of today, you can sign up. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you are uh, listening to today's show, there is a 24 hour coupon discount uh, for anybody that wants to sign up for any of these. It's just Onyx Report 1118, all one word, Onyx Report 1118. I'll put it on the screen in a little bit. That is a 24 hour discount uh, that you can take advantage of if you're interested in taking any of these, uh, the, whether it's the course, the primary course, or the three part webinar that starts December 2nd, uh, as well as you can go through and look at the various merchandising. I've been talking about this for the last few weeks. You know, you can find uh, Institute for Black Male Support merchandise here, as well as some Onyx Report uh, specific kind of issues like Sacred Black Masculine. Um, you know, uh, t-shirts and uh, uh, hoodies, things of that nature. So you can kind of delve into some of that. There's any, any, everything from mugs to shirts to, you know, everything else. So there's quite a bit going on here, but the central focus is that with this Institute for Black Male Support, I mean, Black Male Studies, excuse me, what we're doing is really holding courses and webinars specific to black men in an effort to allow the field to be accessible, right? Accessible across the board um, to people that may not be at a given university, right? So I, I invited a couple of good brothers to come <coughs> in and talk a little bit about their experiences um, in a manner that would allow us to kind of understand why an Institute for Black Male Studies would be needed. Uh, so if I could start with, with you, Dr. Neal, just very briefly, uh, yeah. if you could tell us what in your life experience has made it such that um, you would need or, or you find relevance in uh, 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 an Institute for Black Male Studies. What in your life experience would kind of highlight that? Yeah, what, you know, um, I would, you know, I, I would have to really point to my education you know, and, uh, and and point to the fact that um, uh, K through 12 um, and higher education um, did not equip me with the type of tools that I, I needed as a black man to navigate this society, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think many of us um, have to, we, we become autodidacts, many of us, Mm -hmm. have to uh, discover the information for ourselves, um, information, um, you know, about, you know, the economy that we that we've inherited and uh, and, and how to navigate it. Um, uh, information even about this, the, the educational structure, just the, you know, um, the the political dynamics that 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 we have to to deal with. And so I think and, and it's just in a very basic, in a very, very basic way. Um, just the, the the basic education needed that a black man or a black male youth um, or adolescents would need to successfully navigate the society. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, let me get uh, Gigi, the G with the PhD, Green Gorilla. How you doing, sir? How are you? Can you hear me? I can hear you, man. Um, What's going on, man? How are you this evening? How's I'm everybody well. this evening? Good, good. Yeah, um, just like I said, because you know I didn't want to bombard anyone, but I just wanted to kind of find out from your experience, brother, why is it necessary to have a, a, an institute for Black male studies? Why do you think that would be? Uh, for a whole host of reasons, many of which you've already covered thus far. 
in your presentation of uh, what you just discussed in terms of the social media, the various uh, ways in which black men are vulnerable to domestic violence, to uh, misrepresentation, to uh, defamation, to derogation. Uh, black men need to have a, a means by which to understand their own existence on their own terms. Mm -hmm. And I think black male studies will afford them the opportunity to do that. Uh, it seems like everyone has a right uh, in today's culture to express themselves in, in benevolent uh, ways such that their ontology is essentially uh, dignified. Mm -hmm. But black men, on the other hand, are consistently problematized uh, mm -hmm. from beginning to end, from birth to death. And uh, even within death, it seems like we aren't afforded the opportunity to discuss what our experience is and what we want out of uh, politics, what we want out of media, what we want out of relationships, what we want out of education. It just seems like at every turn, we're marginalized and we're pushed to the periphery. Mm -hmm. And black male studies will give us an opportunity to study ourselves on our own terms, to develop our own epistemology, which is form of knowledge production. It'll give us the opportunity to develop our own sociology, which is our understanding of our social relationships and our experiences. And it will give us the opportunity or afford us the opportunity to, de to develop our own value systems. Hmm. So, I, you know, so th that's that's what I would take from it. But, you know, my experience uh, in, in the society in which I live is one checkered with, you know, good and bad. But, uh, you know, black men are vulnerable in ways that we don't often too readily admit. Mm -hmm. And uh, until we, you know, can openly and honestly and earnestly uh you know, come to the conclusion that like we suffer from a lot uh, of vulnerabilities, and, and, and if we can't just openly and, and, and honestly and earnestly just let the world know this, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to continue to be the uh, whipping boy, the boogeyman, and it's, it's about it's about time for a change. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, I'm going to bring up a longtime uh, guest of the show, um, and I haven't had him on here. In quite a while um international storyteller uh baba the storyteller i can bring him up for a moment want to uh talk a little bit from get his perspective on why such an institute by me might be necessary from his vantage point how you doing man i am doing incredibly well and even better to be in the midst of these brothers me too <laughs> Um, hey, man, look, you and I, we talk a lot, so I'm, I'm just going to be real here. Um, there's an old adage. It says, um, until the lion has his own storyteller, his tale will always be told by the hunter. So when we're talking about this institute, one of the things I want to lay the foundation for before uh, anything uh, is people think that this is something that just occurred that this is something that um, you had an idea for and that you just put out. People need to understand this has been over 25 years mm -hmm. in the making. This has been a part of the maturation process of Dr. Johnson. And I'm gonna sing your praises because I know you don't like this, so I'm gonna do it here and I'm gonna do it now. Here's why we need this institute. I watched this brother walk across the stage when he received his doctorate. I watched him through some of the ceremonies when he was going through this. And when you went through this, <laughs> I must say, this just came to me. The brother walked across the stage. Everybody was walking across at one point. This was a different ceremony. Mm -hmm. And when he was, before he was handed his, doc, his doctorate, he dipped and he slid across the stage. Damn. Now, come on. Come on you now. Go, man. You know, why do we need an institute? Look, man, my story is not unique. It's not unique at all. If I start telling you about being put in special ed classes and being accosted by police officers, look, we could go on ad, ad nauseum about that. Everyone, we have a very similar story. The fact that we all have that very similar story and we are surviving and we are here uh, speaks to the need of the institute. Right. 
I could not work in the U.S. I had to create a global presence. I had to leave the country in order to be able to become who I needed to be. Um, so it's not so much that um, there is an exact need for the Institute as there is a desperate need for Black men together, for Black men to come together, and for Black men to create our own agency. Because if you look at what's happening in the world right now, I get, I'm communicated with all over the world constantly. And if you look at how the world perceives us, as opposed to how we're perceived here, mm. then you know, you get to see once you, how dire our straits are here in this country. Because in a lot of ways, like what Malcolm said, here's, here's why we come together. It's like what Malcolm said. I think it was message to the grassroots. You're not catching hell because you're a Methodist. You're a Baptist. You're not catching hell because you are a, a Republican or a Democrat. You're catching hell because you're a black man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think the Institute is a place where regardless of socioeconomic status or political leanings, mm -hmm. where brothers can actually come together and we can create a, a discussion, a conversation and uh, agency around our very survival. Right. This is not an academic thing. So right. uh, I'm just gonna put that out there. I got huge love for you, Dr. Johnson. You're doing yeah. it, man. You, you're here, man. <laughs> well, we, we are, man. And I, and I just wanna ex, you know, extend a thank you to every brother up here. I'm gonna bring up next the, uh, the esteemed BGS, uh, who uh, has been a guest of the show several times and is, is, is one of the reasons that I'm even on YouTube, because he's been putting his foot in my behind about getting up here at least a year before I actually did. <laughs> but how you doing, man? Yeah, sometimes it's hard to get the bull to move, but when he does, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when he does, boy, that's, that's, you know, the, the world shakes. Well, I want to get your, your, your opinion. And I'm saying this not only in terms of your own life, but even in terms of, you know, we've talked before on the show about yeah. you working with your, your grandson even mm -hmm. what is what is you know what do you think uh the need is for a black male studies um both in terms of the field and the institute itself just what what are your thoughts about the need uh, for that? as the other brothers were talking i was thinking about it is that um since even before this country became a country man when we were first got here off the boat into slavery right mm -hmm. uh black males especially black males were always a problem to be managed right right to be contained to be managed uh and they're always a resource to be managed right mm -hmm. uh and they're solving uh uh they solve uh, the the black male problem you know to actually quote you know get us a little feeling of dr neil my inspiration right um we have been it, 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 the problems that we've been uh, put in books and studied is not to study our problems the problems of black men or black males it's basically how to manage the problems that black males might cause in society from 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 white men to white women to to our, even our own women mm. it's we can never tell our story it's always they want to tell our story because we are the problem and we are the problem to be managed and the thing is, this this beginning, you know, starting with the black manosphere and continuing on into, you know, into academia where it really needs to be had, because, you know, the, the brothers can't can't discuss black male problems, even with their own sisters in academia to where these problems can be solved. Right. And this is what the black male institute needs to be, because now we can actually study not from a problem to be managed. Right and not from a problem to be contained or not from our dysfunction, right? Mm -hmm. it's a, it's so now we can actually study how can we solve what black men are and what black, pro what, what black male problem, uh, what, how to solve black male problems coming from the little boys that can't read in the mm -hmm. freaking third grade, okay? Mm -hmm. Like, like uh, Jellibus says, get put in into, continue to be put into, uh, into special ed and make mm -hmm. money the thing is they're not making money they're not losing money uh, uh making money by putting little black boys uh into cages like which is all special ed really is okay they're they're this they're, they're uh black males from the time that he hit uh, uh kindergarten are problems to be managed mm -hmm. and nobody nobody not even our own sisters will talk about solving the problem 
Mm-hmm. Isn't it? It doesn't make sense. You know, you look at the guy Nakrasi, you know, I bless him, right? Okay, you got there. You climbed up that mountain for over 50 years and you got to the top of it, right? You have mm-hmm. power. Mm-hmm. Okay. They talk about everything else except how do you get 750,000 of your brothers out of prison? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> how do you get, how do you get, no, I'm, I'm not going to cuss on your channel. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> how do you get 150,000 of your brothers off the streets that are homeless? Yeah. How do you get the 20% of black males that can't even have, don't even have a freaking income mm-hmm. to get jobs? Mm-hmm. How do you get your black boys to read? Mm-hmm. You know, how, how do you let 70% of your black, like in, your, in, at your institution, Dr. Johnson, how do you let 70% of your black male freshmen then walk through that gauntlet through, 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 through elementary and middle school and high school and finally get to be freshmen and they flunk out in the first year? Makes no sense. And nobody mm-hmm. says anything. It's a problem yeah. to be managed. We all we want to do, I always hear, we want to keep them out of jail. Okay? Right. Right. Or keep them on the street, keep them out of jail. Stop them from selling drugs. That's a problem to be managed. That's not solving their problem. Mm-hmm. And what the institute, I hope, will do is talk about how do we solve black male problems? How do we understand ourselves, understand our problems, mm-hmm. understand where the, the, the impetus of where this stuff comes from? Yeah. You know, because if you can't understand where the problem comes from, you can't understand how you can solve exactly. the problem. Exactly. Right. And nobody, and like I said, why should why should a brother like me, uh, brothers that are in this, uh, you know, in this circle, brothers that are here listening to us online, why should we have to f- travel eight thousand miles to go to Scotland to study our problem that's right here? We have all the brains here. And the thing is, is that you know, you know, I, I, I you know. America is one of the greatest uh, uh, learning institutions, you know, uh, uh, as a collective in the world. Mm-hmm. It solves it solves all these problems. It solves uh, energy problems, it solves medical problems. It solves how to go to space, how, uh, computer problems and mm-hmm. something that's 300 years old, which is black male problems. They can't they they have no will to even solve, not even around women. Mm-hmm. So the thing is, like I said, that's why they always tell us. Uh, uh, we actually mentioned black male problems. How come you can't solve it yourself? Okay, it, it, men need to come in and solve it. In other words, we have to save ourselves because nobody else will. So we, so they, they won't let us really, you know, because I know you get pushed back all the time, Doctor Johnson. You've been fighting this fight for a good ten years. How to introduce? How to introduce solving black male problems? They won't let you do it. There has to be a place, a formal place, where men can actually go formally learn from experts about how to solve their problems. Mm. How to understand themselves. And that's why you need a black male institute. Well, I much mm. much appreciate it. I, man, that's absolutely it. I I think for me, when I think about this, I think about, you know, I started college in nineteen ninety two. I've been teaching now for twenty two years. I've taught elementary school, middle school, high school, uh, I've taught uh, undergrad and I've taught graduate students as well. And one of the things I found throughout my entire experience was how inconsistent it was um, for black men to be singled out, to be analyzed appropriately, uh, to actually have accurate data. I mean, I've said, I've talked about this on, on my show for, you know, for the last year. I've been to conferences and had and attended sessions with, uh, you know, up to eight PhDs on a panel talking about black males and they're using everything but data. You know what I mean? And this is the comfortable level that people are accustomed to when talking about black males using stereotype, anecdotal situations. And this somehow suffices in regard to there being a serious dialogue about what black men are experiencing. And so I, I, I'm at this point where when I look back on my education, I've sat in classes that were not even supposed to necessarily be gender studies cl- classes, but they were turned into such. And I've watched professors stand there and describe black men like monsters incapable and i'm telling you and quoting incapable of loving their children right not present vo- avoiding responsibility and these are academics no data no charts no analysis just one professor up there just talking and this this stands in the place of a real dialogue now when i come to this space and i look at brothers who are creating channels creating videos creating content around teaching like when i you know for example if i look at dr neil and Gigi, one of the things i see is you guys are conducting classes essentially online you know what i mean and 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 the question it it becomes you know well why are you doing it here 
right? What are the limitations in place that don't allow us to do it elsewhere? You know, when my boy Jello, but like I said, is a global storyteller. He essentially turns the globe into a classroom. But one of the things he often ends up doing in countries that many of us wouldn't even fathom to think about is advocating for black males, boys and men, right? And many of these countries, many of these places, they have questions about black men based on media, based on things they've seen, based on things they've heard, based on music or music videos, right? And their questions are, are, are often, and I don't wanna speak for them, but often very similar in terms of, um, you know, the, the expected failure or the expected, you know, kind of inability of black men to be able to articulate themselves or engage society in any kind of equitable manner. So when I look at the works of all of you and, and you know, many more of our brothers, I see us pushing toward this kind of dynamic, this black male studies, even in informal areas. We're doing this work because we haven't been allowed to really do it in the established spaces. I teach one class a year in the spring. I just, that's it, one class. And, and I get however many students I get in there, and then I get another crop a year later, but not in any in-depth way. And I don't see it happening across the board. Any thoughts about that from any of y'all? Just in terms of your own experiences and the limitations of this. Yeah, I, I just think that um, we can't wait for academia to, yeah. to catch up with yeah. what we're doing, yeah. okay? Um, we don't have the time and, um, and, and really the patience. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and so this is ne necessary, you know, um, we have the tools and I've said this here in other places and, and, and this is serious. I mean, the tools of technology, um, are so critical. Um, technology has emancipated so many people all over the world and this, it has, it's emancipating us right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so it is imperative that we maximize these tools and, and to do the work that needs that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and we don't we don't need, you know, permission um, from established institutions. Um, I, I really think that, you know, um, um, the work that we do, um, if it's good work and it is good work, um, the, the folks who are supposed to get on board will eventually get on board. OK, mm -hmm. uh, but but it has to go forward, you know, because as BGS said, you know, we have we have major issues. We have major problems that need to be addressed that need to be, uh, uh, you know, interrogated that need to be, you know, dealt with in, in, in the open. that yeah. need to be talked about in a way that is uncensored, um, you know, uninhibited. Uh, un un uninterrupted by anything and and we have not we have not had that and uh our situ our situation as black men is 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 so dire um that we have to we have to do this so yeah. um so this is this is an inevitable um outgrowth of of your work and the work that all of us you know um have been doing up to this point yeah I think if if I can have a closing thought on this, Dr. Johnson, mm -hmm. I'm going to I'm going to piggyback. But I want to put I want to put this out. We do have the answers. Mm. We do know what is needed for black boys and black men. We we are well aware. I think one of the things that we have to make sure that we put on the table is that even though we have the answers, we are living in an oppressive system, a system which mm. when you have the answers, you are literally put to death. Mm -hmm. Our martyrs, we have martyrs going back hundreds of years, black men who had the answers and they mm -hmm. have been killed for having the answers. So I, I want to make sure that uh, I put that out. And just a, a quick example is this false polarization. I've been working with black boys for damn near 30 years. Right. We have we have the answers. Right, right to passage. We know right. what to do. And I have been blocked mm -hmm. for 30 years in doing that. And there's this false polarization that is just a, a, a minute example. For example, anytime you begin to help black boys, you will hear, uh, what about black girls? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. There's this false polarization and this narrative where we are bought in to defend helping those who are most in need. Right. So I want to, I, 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 I feel the need to put that out because this is a very dynamic group of brothers. Mm -hmm. There are brothers all over the world. And we do have the answers, but it is going to be a fight. 
I don't want anybody to think that anyone is just going to let this happen. Mm. Tulsa 1921. Mm. Mm. I want to I want to share a word um, that came in uh, and then get any, you know, any, you know, fa final thoughts uh, anybody might want to extend. But this came uh, from a brother we all know, and he shot me this message. And I thought, you know what, let me let me share it um, in regard to this whole issue of black male studies. Let's see here. Uh, OK, that's not. I don't know why it's coming up that way. There we go. All right. Okay. So this is a word from Dr. Tommy J. Curry, author of The Man Not. And uh, he sent in a word about what we're doing as far as black male studies. It says black male studies is a paradigm demanding the humanity of black men launch um, inquiry into the lives and deaths of black men and boys. The rhetoric of dehumanization e.g. black men are trash, and the lies spread concerning black male deviance and violence require a scholarly response and conceptual reorientation. Social scientific data is clear. Black men are death bound and experience some of the most <clears throat> frequent and brutal forms of interpersonal violence in the United States. Despite this reality, black males are told they cannot be subjects of study. The various forms of disadvantage they suffer is erased and replaced with other bodies who are able to be more readily recognized as civil. We need a new way of thinking, new theories for study, and the reclamation of the lives of black men and boys in the U.S. So that's from Dr. Curry, right? Anybody else? Any any thoughts? Because I promised I wasn't going to hold you guys all night. I just really wanted to uh, just get a, a, a sense out there of how necessary uh, the work we're doing is. And, and trust and believe I will be inviting every one of these brothers on this panel and more uh, to participate in the Institute in whatever way they're comfortable. Uh, I also want to highlight black males mm -hmm. who've been doing work that uh, is for the upliftment of black male, men and boys mm -hmm. for however long they've been doing it. So whether we're talking about academics who've written pieces over the decades, pieces that get ignored, uh, mm -hmm. particularly in gender studies as they focus on black men and boys, and that's not considered gender studies for some reason in the academy black men and boys don't have a, don't gender, have a gender yeah you know but uh also you know black men who are doing work relevant to the upliftment of of, of said men and boys i want to bring them in in various capacities so again it, it depends on the comfort of the people involved but this is a space that i want to create where we can actually engage the field without having to wait for a given university to do it but any any other thoughts any other concerns yeah. any other ref, uh, reflections just, before just, we go I just have something a Gnostic thought. Okay. okay. I said, I said uh, until Bataille gets a voice, he can't name the part of, parts of himself and he can't create. Mm. Bataille has to have a voice. Until we get mm. a voice, we can't create our own destiny. Mm. All right. Yeah. And that's, that's about the, uh, I don't know if you can hear me now. We can oh, hear yeah, you. Definitely. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the component of black male agency, it just seems as though uh, our agency has been perceived as a pernicious kind of agency that operates to destroy and to uh, exploit and to subject others to violence, when in actuality, uh, we need to study the ways in which violence and exploitation, manipulation, That's and right. domination and oppression is exacted on us. Mm -hmm. and, and right now, the current paradigms in the academy, uh, in politics, in the media don't afford us a space to do the kind of consciousness raising that's necessary to formulate a theory about the ways in which we are subjected to those forms of domination, oppression, violence, exploitation, and the like. And marginalization, which has been rationalized, predicated upon others' theorization about their own uh, marginalization. And so uh, mm -hmm. we, we wanna basically develop a space, a formal space, where right. we can work on theory mm -hmm. of a wide variety of kinds, but mostly undergirded by empirical uh, data to mm -hmm. try to demonstrate that we are human beings. Right. We have a right to function, to mm -hmm. flourish, to mm -hmm. thrive, to think, to practice democracy, to demonstrate agency and to develop it mm -hmm. without being typecast as mm -hmm. evil ontologically right. problematically flawed creatures right. so right. I, yeah, that's all i want and you know it's a long time coming 
you know, we've been fighting these battles on social media within uh, the academy itself. I mean, people mm-hmm. speak to us derisively. They, they, they speak to us in ways in which our own problems have to be absorbed into their problems. Uh, any issues we bring up have to be absorbed into their issues. A- at some point, we have to draw the line and say, look, we are human beings as well. We hurt. We feel pain just like anyone else feels. We're subjected mm-hmm. to the same rigors of the world and of society as anyone else. Please give us the opportunity to speak to our own issues without framing us as inherently flawed and, inher- and inherently oppressive. Please give us the space by which to express our own humanity and our own value. Mm. And, so, and, and, and that's definitely needed, absolutely. I think, um, you know, when I think of brothers who have experienced everything from, you know, police ab- abuse to, um, you know, violation, sexual violation at a young age, there's there are very few spaces I've found, um, particularly in regard to study, where that is treated as um as a as a valid experience as something that black men engage you know it's very very rarely do i do i hear that happening and i want uh you know the institute for black male studies to be a space where not only is that though are are those experiences affirmed but we can actually delve into the material about uh what we're not hearing in other spaces in in regard to what is going on with black males so whether it's uncomfortable material or whether it's it's dealing with history, whether it's dealing with theory, I want to be able to have black men uh, be able to engage or, or be engaged seriously, and not just as a token, you know, uh, of of some corporate company, you know, who wants to just have our image up or something of that nature. I want it to be a space where we can actually engage black men uh, on grounds that are that are serious, that are scholarly, and yet not necessarily limited to people who have advanced degrees. I mean, the range of discourse is, I would say, will range from uh, senior level in high school to graduate school. That's the range. The dialogue can be can take place across those spectrums. It's not, there, there are no exams, there are no tests. Uh, it, is, it is purely a space for study. Reading is uh, clearly voluntary, but the more you read of the suggested readings posed, the more you're gonna understand. So that's gonna be kind of the structure that we're using there, but the focus is on black men and boys being heard, being valued, being understood, and centered in the analysis, not made sidelined, not brushed under the table, and not having their numbers used in other spaces for other demographics, political, uh, you know, uh, currency. We're talking specifically about black males, and and yes, part of the discussion is uh, what black males can do to change their own conditions. We started with, you know, as you guys know, the last few months, we've started with the black male political agenda. We're gonna continue with that, but we're also gonna engage, you know, different different ideas about what we can do. And the, the finishing assignments at the end of the semesters are collective works that are, that are structured toward change. So one of the things we'll be doing uh, in this first class is actually putting together documents uh, to extend to the United Nations as far as what's on the black male political agenda, the very last point on there speaks mm-hmm. to the genocide of black men as recognized by the United Nations, right? So we're going to be using this class to, to, you know, to really expand on those dynamics. But I'm just simply saying that there needs to be a space for that because I think what the brothers have articulated here is dead on. We can't wait for the academy to do it. And, you know, we can't always wait until we have the capital to buy a building and fly a bunch of people in to have a conference that only a few people can make it to. We want to make this, you know, and put it in a space where, you know, it can be accessed globally. And so, like I said, there'll be free materials. There'll be writing materials that are, that, that are posted out. If any scholars have materials they want to donate to be extended for free, the, the, the Institute is definitely a space you can do that through. There'll be webinars, there'll be courses. So the price packages will vary. So hopefully anything will be accessible, you know, something will be accessible to everyone at some level. There'll even be free content that'll be posted out as well. Um, But I just want to kind of extend that to make sure people know uh, that this is where we're going. Now, let me see. Uh, Oh, Well, let me just say this. It's very important for people to understand that, you know, (laughs) and and I think Dr. Ronald Neal has spoken about this on several occasions. Mm -hmm. Black men have a different set 
of circumstances that they're dealing with than any other demographic in the United States. Right. And we have to be mindful of the fact that we're not trying to point fingers at anybody else. What we're trying to do is make sense of our experience on our mm -hmm. terms, not anyone else's terms. Mm -hmm. And it's long overdue because everyone will, will say to us, well, you're problematic. We've held it down. We've been the backbone without mm -hmm. looking at the systems in place, the mm -hmm. structures and the institutions in place that have subsidized the flourishing and the thriving of some demographics, while at the same time, working overtime to oppress, to incarcerate, to pathologize black right. male existence. And mm -hmm. it's not just on an interpersonal level that we have problems. We have a problem with the system of anti-black misandry in the United States of America. And until that is addressed, and it's addressed with candor, mm -hmm. and it's addressed it's in earnest, mm -hmm. right? We're gonna to continue to bump heads with, with people in the black community, mm -hmm. men right. and women, okay? Uh, people who consider themselves to be subaltern publics or subgroups within the black community. We're mm -hmm. gonna to continue to have these disagreements and these arguments. And the last thing I wanna say is, I think Dr. Ronald Neal's, what the work he's been doing lately is important. Not, mm -hmm. not that anybody else's work is not important because BGS has been doing this work for quite a bit of time. Dr. Johnson, you brought me into this space. But the reality is, to some extent, we have to understand that directly after the civil rights movement, everyone else has been shoehorned mm. into advantages related to the, civ the Civil Rights Act mm. and affirmative action policies, except for mm. black men who got a heavy mm -hmm. dose of the exact opposite. We were mm -hmm. basically incarcerated. We were uh, left un unemployed, underemployed, and we're dealing with a, sis, a series of stresses and checks, and it's it's time for us to to study those, right? Without without being perceived as somehow morally problematic, mm -hmm. without being essentially and ontologically categorized as deficient, it's time mm -hmm. for that move. So yeah. it, you know we're going to do that work regardless as to whether you like it or not. So absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that, and I just want to confirm. Uh, uh, for those who, who may be questioning, remember, we do have an office hours show that we'll be doing. Uh, any of the guests that are on the panel today are absolutely welcome uh, to, to, to come through. It isn't it, by no means. Is it uh, is there any pressure whatsoever? But, uh, you know, to my YouTube and Patreon members, you're welcome to uh, come through. The links are in the community tab and or uh, on Patreon, uh, there's a post there. So uh, there's a link uh, for that as well. So come on through the after hours. We'll be closing out soon. Um, I just wanna make sure that any last thoughts from my guest, I didn't wanna block anybody off. Anybody else had anything they wanted to say? Uh, we're about to shut it down in a, in a quick moment. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just say, um, you know, what, what we're doing is asserting the humanity of black men. and. Yes. And uh, and we have to, and we are and we are unapologetic about it. Um, if every other every other demographic, particularly the United States, um, enjoys the lug the luxury of of freedom, enjoys the luxury of of rights and protection, every other demographic, and they take it for granted. Mm -hmm. um, and we have been conditioned and socialized to take a back seat and. We have come to we've reached we've reached the conclusion that that this arrangement no longer works, mm. and it is important that what we're doing we know we, we, we're we're doing this because we have a right to do this, we're doing this because we are entitled to this. We we this is necessary. This is an an, an imperative, and that we are bucking against the 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 way in which we have been criminalized, the way in which. Um, you know, we have been pathologized in so many ways by so many other demographics. Mm -hmm. And and if this means that, you know, um, you know, we we find ourselves in the crosshairs of, you know, forces that, you know, um, are just, you know, arrayed against us, then so be it. I happen to think I happen to think that what we're doing is going to flourish, that what we what we're, what, what we're doing is going to grow. I happen to think that um, that we are going to, um, you know, not be 
um, 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 assaulted uh, in the manner that prior generations of black men have been assaulted who have sought to demonstrate black male freedom okay because I, I just happen to think that we're just in a moment in history where this this work has to be done and we're the people to do it yeah yeah absolutely and i want to i want to thank all the brothers for taking time out of their schedules uh to come up and, and and share a few words i really appreciate it i appreciate everyone that's come through to listen definitely everyone that's been supportive of this and there have been scores of, of folks on facebook who responded to the event announcement for the launch of the institute i want to thank everybody for that uh patronize the site go check it out uh look through it sift through it see what you like um but definitely support in any endeavor you can uh, you know send your post your email address and share share with people let people know uh because we definitely want to get brothers involved in in making this space instrumental to uh, advancing ourselves anything else before we close out fellas it's been an honor uh, trust me the honor is mine um senior on the pa on, on on the panel bgs anything before we close out okay i think he's he's uh, occupied I, I, I was gonna say it's long past time i'm glad the uh brothers are here and there's one said i, I think i said it on the uh, after hours you know the generals are here and god damn it we got an army <laughs> <laughs> yes, <sir. All> right. <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you brother thank you uh, dr neil thank you uh uh, uh dr phd g with the phd uh, thank you brother jellaba and brother bgs um y'all know how i like to close out and and as requested the close out is actually on the shirts and the merchandise on the uh, the institute website so you can yeah, check the, that out the shirt is tight so <laughs> <laughs> i can i got my copy so <laughs> much appreciated all right well y'all know how it is um let me just uh put this thing up here uh, I'm here to tell you, brothers, we are not criminals by birth, perennial rapists, incapable intellects, man children, sperm donors, child support wellsprings, success objects, walking phalluses, ATM machines, lottery tickets, brainless henchmen, valueless assassins, pro bono mercenaries, unpaid bodyguards, interchangeable stepfathers, child discipline proxies, unpaid repairmen, workhorses, emotional tampons, or any other socially accepted dehumanizing stereotype. We are thinkers, inventors, innovators, leaders, fathers, warriors, and men. Embrace your humanity, know your worth, and extend your time, attention, and resources only to those who genuinely respect you. And remember, your worth is not defined by meeting other people's narcissistic, selfish, and unrealistic needs. You define your worth. Peace. <laughs> Use that to actually cast out some black female demons, too. Oh. <laughs>